Um, another thing that I've learned, one of the most important things that I've learned along the way is that drugs are not the problem. And I know that people who um, study drugs, like me when I started studying drugs, I got into this business because I wanted to help people with their drug addiction, and I thought that was one of the most admirable things that someone could do, especially when you believe, like I believe, that drugs were the reasons for all the problems in community, in my community. I came from a, a black community that was um, economically disadvantaged, um, and so I thought drugs were the problem. But then along the way, I discovered that drugs aren't the problem. I discovered things like 80 to 90% of the people who use drugs don't have a problem. That means they're not addicted. That means they go to work, they take care of their families, they pay their taxes, they pay their bills, they are responsible people. They are you, they are me. And then sometimes they are the President of the United States. So you, we, we all know that the last three presidents of the United States all used drugs when they were young men. Um, Bill Clinton, marijuana, George Bush, marijuana, widely suspected of using cocaine, Barack Obama, Claude, of course, admits to using marijuana, cocaine, uh, when he was a, a younger man. Now, one of the, the point here is not to uh, tarnish their reputation or say anything poorly about these guys, because these guys, they do a really good job themselves in tarnishing their reputation, so they don't need me to do that. So that's not my point. My point here is that their drug use represents the rule, not the exception. Most people who use drugs are like these guys. They are responsible people. But there's a problem sometimes because when a Barack Obama today talks about his previous drug use, he talks about it as if it was a youthful indiscretion and as if that's was a bad thing. And, and so, so the people who are primarily talking about drugs are people who have done it previously and they're saying that that was a useful indiscretion or other people who are talking about drugs are people who have been identified as those who had a drug problem. They had addiction and they are now in this thing we call recovery. And they are the ones who are out speaking about the horrors of drugs. But people like me, who have used drugs all of my life, and been in the military, and all the rest of those things, and handled my responsibilities, are less likely to be in public talking about their drug use, in part because of the misinformation that the public has about drugs, and in the fear of being vilified for being a drug user. But I have that, I don't have that fear anymore. I don't care what you all think. I'm successful, and um, so the point is, is that I'm out of the closet about my drug use, and I try and encourage other people to get out of the closet about their drug use, so people can change the narrative, to show people how to do this thing right, and to show that most people who use drugs are not pathological. They don't have problems related to their drug use, and this is not to say that people who have problems with their drug use don't deserve our help, because they do. But this is to say that if the vast majority of people who use drugs don't have a problem, that tells you that the issue is not drugs. That tells you that the issue is something else. And it allows you freedom to focus on the real problem. And that's, that's the point. And so that's, that's one of the things that we're trying to make sure we change so we can actually help people who need the help. Now, that takes me to another point. Another point that I've learned along the way is that our major funding agency for drug research, research on these drugs that we're talking about, the psychoactive drugs, the recreational drugs, the major funder is the National Institute on Drug Abuse. They fund 90% or more of all research in this area around the world, and they are biased. And scientists, too, like me, are biased. We're biased towards the negative effects of drugs, and I'll tell you why. And it's not to say that they're bad people, it's just to say 
just to call it what it is. Now, I'll tell you why. Now, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, they have an annual budget of about a billion dollars a year, and as I said, they fund most of the world's research in this area. Their mission is to focus almost exclusively on the negative, the bad things that happens after drug use or related to drug use. And so, if they're focusing all of these resources into these negative aspects of drug use, what kind of picture do you think you will have as a public of drugs? Well, before answering that question, you should think about this too. Because this fact about the money coupled, coupled with this fact, and when we think about scientists, me as a scientist, I tend to err on the side of caution. And when it comes to drugs, it means to focus on these bad things, as if there is no consequence to focusing on these negative things, when in fact there are consequences. The consequences are this. It helps to create this environment in which certain drugs are deemed evil and any use is considered pathological. So if we know someone who used heroin, we might say, wow, you're an addict, or, but that's not the case. 23% of the people or so who use heroin are addicts, but the other 77% or so are not. Now, it also helps to have this unrealistic, or help to create this unrealistic focus on eliminating these drugs at any cost, particularly when the cost of eliminating these drugs is felt primarily by people in our society that we don't care for, various minority groups. This allows us to have those kinds of policies. Now, I think Upton Sinclair said it best as we think about the scientist's role in all of this when he said that it's difficult to get a man, in this case a woman too, to understand something when his or her salary depends upon his or her not her, him or her not understanding it. So if you're being paid to look at primarily the negative effects of drugs, that's what you're going to look at. And that's what you're going to report. That's what you're going to report in the scientific literature, in textbooks, because the textbooks come from the scientific literature. That's what's reported in the popular press. And so the public has a skewed perspective a per uh, on drugs, a, per a perspective that is primarily negative. You have this disproportionate focus on negative stuff. Now, when you have this disproportionate focus on the negative aspects of drugs, then you have an entire population miseducated about drugs. Now, that wouldn't be bad. That wouldn't be so bad if there weren't negative consequences. But there are negative consequences. As I was talking about the enforcement of our drug laws selectively negatively impact specific groups in the country. And so me as a scientist, when I thought about my participation in the subjugation of the people for whom I care, it reminded me of the words of Dane James Baldwin when he said, to be Negro, to be a Negro, in this case a Negro scientist in this country and be relatively conscious, is to be in a rage almost all of the time. And that's kind of where I'm at. But I have to do something with that rage. And when, as I think about my rage, I can't be, you can't, you can't operate in a world and, and have rage because then it only impacts you negatively. So one of the things that I've been trying to do is come up with solutions. And I have a few of the things that we can do together. And I like to have, I like to hear what your thoughts are when I think of these solutions, when I uh, delineate these the, the solutions. One of the things that we can do is we can work to change the legal status of our laws. I mean, we, we can think about things like decriminalization. The country of Portugal decriminalized all drugs in 2001. 
and before them the Czech Republic decriminalized drugs. Now, when we think about decriminalization, that simply says, treat drugs like traffic violations. That is, if someone has a drug-related violation as it relates to possession, we might give them a fine, but they're not subjected to criminal offenses. They can't go to jail. That's decriminalization. But drug sales remain illegal. You still cannot sell drugs legally in the society. Now, as a public health professional, my major concern with drugs, street drugs, are the adulterants, the cuts. Decriminalization doesn't do anything for the adulterants. You still will have drugs that are contaminated with chemicals far more dangerous than the uh, drug that people are seeking. So in order to deal with the adulterants, we must legally regulate the market. Otherwise, we still are subjected to the adulterants on the street. And so I am now a proponent for legally regulating the market. But if we have to take baby steps and decriminalize first, increase our education, and some other sorts of things, I'm all for that as well. But ultimately, if we're going to deal with the adulterants, we have to legally regulate the market. Another thing that we can do as a society, you, me, is that we can call out racial discrimination for what it is and call out the people who support it. Like in our country, we, you all know the numbers. You know who are in our jails in this society. I mean, uh, you know the numbers, 2.2 million people behind bars, Five, we have 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's incarcerated population. Black men in this country, for example, make up 6% of the general population, but damn near 40% of the prison population. You just go down the line, you see these horrible statistics, and it's largely based on racial discrimination. And we have been complicit. And we are afraid to call the spade a spade. We have a black president who can't say what I just said. And so when you have that situation, you don't have a free country, people. Another thing that we can do is that, well, uh, I'm sorry. Another thing that we can do is we can change the narrative of who's a drug user. I'm trying to start this conversation, I'm trying to do it myself, trying to make sure that the country where we think of a drug user, we don't only have a person who had a problem with drugs being the face of a drug user. It would be like when you're doing driver's education and the person who's talking about driving is the person who always gets in an accident, who always had problems with driving previously, and now they are educating you about driving. That's the situation that we have with drugs. So we have to change that narrative. If the only people talking about it are the people who had a problem with it, your society has a problem. You as a society, as a thinking and an educated population, you have a problem. Well, I don't know what happened with my slides, but that, that, that's fine. So, I just want to leave you all with uh, the point there, that what I have to say is not necessarily popular. And I don't care about being popular. I'm getting old, I'm gonna die soon. I have children who have to deal with this society. I am more concerned about being truthful and making sure that I leave a better world for young people who come after me. And so when I think of you all, that's what you should worry about. Popularity is not the goal. And the people who I look look up to are the people who were my heroes. They weren't very popular. They certainly were not popular in mainstream America. They were called communists. They were called rabble rousers. They were called outside agitators. That's what I am. 
and that's what I care about. Now, let's think about popularity. There are some people who we did, and they were popular, but they were wrong. So this is a picture of presidential candidate Jesse Jackson. When he was running for president in 1986, but he uh, eventually ran in 88, but he was campaigning in 1986, one of the things that Jesse Jackson said about drugs, he said that pushers are terrorists and death messengers. Dope is the hound of hell for this generation. This is what Jesse Jackson said. And he was making these comments at the funeral of Lynn Bias. Lynn Bias was the 1986 second overall draft, overall draft pick in the NBA. He was going to the Boston Celtics. He went out and celebrated during draft night and he killed himself. He took some cocaine and other drugs and he died. People said it was crack cocaine and it was indication of how dangerous crack cocaine is, and, but they were wrong. Uh, it was powder cocaine and there were other stuff involved. But nonetheless, the point is, Jesse Jackson was blaming drugs for the problems of the generation. He was wrong. It wasn't drugs. It was employment. It was education. It's all the things that we all know. But drugs were the easy scapegoat. At the same time, my, one of my heroes was saying something very different. Nobody was listening. He was in a lonely place. This is James Baldwin talking about what we should do about the drug laws. Well, no more sound. No. Doesn't matter. This is James Baldwin speaking uh, in, in Washington at the press club. And he was saying what we should do in 1986 when we passed those awful laws that punished crack cocaine 100 times more harshly. What James Baldwin was saying, and he was the only voice, by the way, he was saying we should legalize drugs because the only people who are subjected to the drug laws are poor people, people who can't afford, who can't afford to get around those laws. And he said laws like this will only punish the poor. I mean, now we are 30 years removed and how true that was. Now, I want to tell you something about being lonely from another famous writer or one of my favorite writers, Lorraine Hansberry. She wrote A Raisin, uh, Raisin in the Sun. Um, Lorraine Hansberry's birthday is May 19th, the same day as Malcolm X. Uh, but she wrote about this issue of being lonely. The thing that makes you exceptional, if you are at all, is inevitably, inevitably that which must also make you lonely. Now, I want to leave you here with this final note where you see James Baldwin. I don't know if you can see it as well, but that's James Baldwin behind Lorraine Hansberry, two of my favorite people, being lonely together. This is one of the advantages of being exceptional or lonely. You find some good people in the process, and those are the people you want to find, and those are the people you want to be with, because they'll push you to make your society better. And after all, that is the goal. And with that, let's have some comments and questions and discussion. Thank you all for your time. students that are coming around with Mike. Um, Ryan, you can have this. Please pay attention. It's questions, not testimonials, not statements. Questions, straight questions, please. Thank you. Dr. Hart, thank you for your courage to write this book and say what you are saying. And I'm sorry you're lonely, but I'm sure you're finding good people out there. Um, the nations of Israel and Switzerland, when their children leave high school or drop out, they immediately put them into two years of service to their country. Do you think this would help to uplift the marginalized people of, of uh, the USA plus the wealthy class and the middle income class? So you may, you may know that I, uh, 
I was in the military, and I came from a background disadvantage. So, uh, the, the short answer is there are far more efficient ways to help poor people in this country. Um, it's just that Americans uh, in general are just not committed to it. Uh, what the Swiss do, where I spent about four to six months um, recently, uh, is that they take care of their people, regardless of this military thing. Everybody has basic health care. They try to make sure everybody has housing. Uh, we're one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and we don't do the basics. And we have, we have heated political conversations. In fact, we have some people wanting to impeach President Obama for trying to ensure that everyone has health care. And that plan that he has is weak, weak. And, and we have people complaining. It says something about us as Americans in terms of how we care about our fellow citizens. And, and so we don't need the military for that. We just simply need commitment and we need leadership that says, this is who we are and this is what we're going to do. We're going to take care of our people. And that might, that might mean that some people get over, like people are getting over now on Wall Street and other places. It's just part of the human endeavor. There will always be people who get over. Okay. That's just part of it. Just to let you know, if you guys want to have your book signed by Dr. Uh, Carl Hart, uh, please stay uh, until after the Q&A. It'll be outside. Please. Dr. Hart, Dr. Hart, Dr. Hart, thanks for coming. Um, I was hoping that you could explain uh, to the people here like, what the word uh, ghetto means, the word derives from. The word ghetto? Yeah. I thought it was the, uh, the, the, the Jews in the ghettos uh, 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 in Europe. Uh, 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 I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, the, the reason why I asked is because uh, I, I was hoping that maybe you could explain like, how, they, how they did the research on how when you put uh, people in a small area with limited resources, yeah. you see how they behave. Uh, that's a different question. I thought you were asking me the origins of the word ghetto. I was like, I don't um, so the question that you're asking is, when you have people in uh, conditions uh, in which uh, they're not uh, conducive for people thriving, for example, limited resources, closed spaces, um, uh, 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 not very nice spaces, all of these sorts of things, you can expect that you won't have a good outcome. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what we see in a variety of places. Uh, this is, yeah, uh, absolutely. I think people, I hope people know that, right? This is college, right? Yeah, all right. Dr. Hart, thank you for coming out. Um, you made a statement that the scientists did a study on the negative effects. Did they ever do a study on the positive effects of drugs and what they did for the community? Yeah, uh, so like uh, many of the studies that I published, we talked about the positive effects. Uh, the positive effects when we think about, for example, uh, amphetamines, including methamphetamine. Uh, we and other people have done studies where you see that amphetamines uh, improve cognitive, cognitive functioning in some cases, particularly when people are sleep deprived or fatigued, and it helps them to stay awake when you want them to be working and their body wants to sleep. So militaries use this knowledge our military has used amphetamine since World War II. Um, and so that's, that's, that's some of the positive effects, and we, we know that. And so there are some people who are looking at some of the positive effects. But primarily, what makes the news, uh, and also textbooks, are the negative I'm sorry, you said something about sellers as well. Can, can you? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so when I say change the narrative, I mean 
uh, for example, you don't, you don't typically have someone like me saying that I'm a drug user. And I go to work, I take care of my family, I help handle all my responsibility. And so now, when you have someone who says that someone who uses heroin is, is this irresponsible, whatever kind of person, you now, uh, yeah, this criminal, now, you now have, you now have, hopefully people now will say, wait, wait a second, that's not necessarily the case. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, uh, and so you have a broader picture of what, okay. So now you, <laughs> so now you have a microphone that don't work. <laughs> So now you have you have a view of, 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 of a drug user that is broader. Uh, when you think about, let's just think about marijuana. In 1937, our only view of a marijuana smoker was Johnny, who started smoking marijuana and then eventually ended up killing his mother. That's what we were told in the media, and we believed it. We outlawed marijuana as a result, and, and that's what we believed. And then, now you have all of these people who have admitted to smoking marijuana, including presidents. You can no longer tell a population that when you smoke marijuana, you're gonna end up killing your mother. In 1937, you can tell people that and be believed by a substantial, a, 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 a substantial amount of people. You can't do that today because the narrative has changed. And the narrative has changed in part because these people have come out of the closet about their marijuana use. It's no big deal to admit you use marijuana in the United States today. It's a bigger deal for me to stand up here and say, yeah, of course I've used heroin. Of course I've done this. Course, that's a bigger deal. But you can tell people, you can say to people that if you use heroin, you eventually will become addicted and you're going to look like you belong on Skid Row. Right? And you, can, you will be believed, even though that's not true. Yeah, so like, so the question is related to functional addict. Now, I didn't define what I meant by addict, and I should have. And I simply mean the DSM or the ICD-10 classification. Disruption of psychosocial functioning, those sorts of things. Uh, that's, I simply mean that. Now, if you have these disruptions, then you're not functional. And so the notion of a functional alcoholic it's an oxymoron and it's stupid and it's a pop culture sort of thing. If someone is meeting their obligation and using alcohol and doing those sorts of things, maybe they're being an adult and they have made choices that I want to use alcohol uh, because I don't want to deal with you people. <laughs> uh, and, and, but I'm handling my responsibility. And so the notion of functional alcoholic is a way to over pathologize people. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Uh, quick comment, I couldn't agree more with you on so much of that. I think the new war on crack is tobacco, and that the poor are the ones that are being victimized. My question for you is, would it be fair to say that those of us here as counselors, as educators, should try and educate people to think about drugs street drugs at least, the same way we think about alcohol. In other words, everybody knows alcohol is dangerous, but almost everybody uses it, uh, doesn't have harmful effects, and it's only that 10 to 15 percent that, that develop alcoholism that we should worry about, uh, and not the 80 percent that, that don't. Is that a fair way to look at it? There's not much more to add to what you just said. I mean, absolutely. If we think about our, our drug education, uh, we can think about it uh, having people to understand it's like we do alcohol. When we think about all of these drugs, 
the one that is most dangerous, certainly from a withdrawal standpoint, is alcohol. It's the only one that you can die from. You can't die from heroin withdrawal, but you can die from alcohol withdrawal. And we accept that as a society, and as well we should, and we educate appropriately uh, uh, in, in ways that make sense, and we minimize the harm. Absolutely right. And now back to the tobacco thing, the tobacco issue. Absolutely, tobacco is an interesting one because you have a variety of things going on. You have the decades of deception by the tobacco industry, and that kind of colors how we deal with tobacco in general. So um, when we think about tobacco, the, the, the major compound that we're worried about is nicotine. Nicotine can be one of the most toxic compounds, uh, certainly more toxic than heroin, certainly more toxic than and cocaine. Now, uh, we think about nicotine. Nicotine, though, given its toxicity, potential toxicity, we just deal with it in a smart way. We make sure that one cigarette contains one milligram. 50, mil 50 milligrams of nicotine will kill you. Now, in a pack, you got about 20 milligrams total of nicotine. But we control the unit dose in a way that's smart that we enhance safety as, as much as we can. Uh, and so there are many lessons in the, whole, in the nicotine tobacco story, but we have to be careful not to be colored by our anger at the tobacco companies, because we have to also understand that adults should be allowed to be adults. That is, if they want to smoke tobacco or tobacco-related products, Okay, as an adult, you have that right as long as you're not infringing on other people's right, regardless of what we think of the tobacco company. And sometimes I think people don't separate those sorts of things. I hope that helps. We have time for two more questions before the book signing, so. Okay, I'm not sure how to word this question, but um, I understand we feel lonely in the stance of I feel like if that could be affected, but for those who are adolescents, naive may use that as a reason to lash out and use and make the use into a piece. So have you thought of maybe creating some kind of, like a whole new drug educational plan to introduce to high school, even middle school? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is re related to adolescents and educating adolescents. So I have my own children and I had to do this sort of thing myself. Um, yes, absolutely. We need to do a, a, a diff we need to do differently when it comes to drugs in schools. Um, right now, the drug education in school. I have a 15 year old, and so I've been going following what happens, what 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 the drug education looks like in his school. And he, it's always the kid that has to raise his hand and say, "No, I'm sorry, that's wrong." And and he's the kid that shuts down the conversation be because there's so much misinformation because. Educators have previously gotten away with simply saying wild exaggerations about drugs and not being not being challenged. So we got the first educate the educators. That's number one about drugs. Uh, and, and two, we have to think about drugs just like we think about sex, just like we think about automobiles. Um, disp dispassionately, but uh, making sure we keep people safe. And um, I write about. Adolescents, I write about these things. I write, write about a developing brain. Much of that has been overstated. I write about these sorts of things on my website. I, I, I put some of these writings out there. But absolutely, we have to change it. So you spoke of uh, changing the narrative into a more positive one where drug users are active, drug users are currently seen as responsible users, not being irresponsible, not addicts. How do you see this affecting? Employment, considering how many uh, jobs require a drug test or it's conditional upon employment that you don't use drugs at all? Great question. Question related to like urine tests. So one of the things that happened, I didn't say, about the 1988 legislation, the one that punished crack a hundred times more harshly, in that legislation, Congress directed the country, people, universities, a uh, number of folks who receive federal funds, those people had to ensure that their institutions, their organizations were drug free by the year 1995. 
And so that's why we got this widespread sort of urine testing. So the notion of drug free is so stupid that it shouldn't be entertained in an academic institution. It's so low level. There's never been a drug free world and never will be. You don't want to live in one. Uh, so it's such a remedial notion, but it's a notion that guides how we do things in this country. So number one, what we have to do is we have to push back on that sort of thinking. Um, uh, uh, and so uh, there are some employers who drug test, but several now are not drug testing. It's far more important to look at people's behavior than their urine. Uh, and, and so that's what we have to get people to focus on. Um, it's not, it, that, that hasn't happened everywhere, but there are people who are pushing back on it and we need to push back as a country. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Hart, for uh, this wonderful, wonderful information and education. So